Uh, good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of session six of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch their mobile phones to silent. The first item of business is to decide whether to take items six, seven and eight in private. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Thank you. Under agenda item number two, we are taking evidence from John Swinney, MSP, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery on the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill at Stage 1. Mr Swinney is accompanied in the room by Steve McGregor, who is the Head of Parliament and Legislation Unit, and Rachel Rayner, the Scottish Government Legal Department's Deputy Legislation Coordinator. And also joining us online are three policy leads on the bill. They are Claire Morley, Craig Robertson and Erin McCreary. May I welcome you all to the meeting. Uh, I'd like to invite the Deputy First Minister to make any opening remarks. Thank you, Convener, and I welcome this opportunity to make a brief opening statement about the proposed uh, made, made affirmative powers in the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill. The Delegated Powers Memorandum prepared for the Bill set out the details of 15 delegated powers proposed for Scottish Ministers in the Bill. Of these, five are capable of engaging the made affirmative procedure, and I expect the committee will have some questions on that issue. It is worth emphasising that the default for those powers is the normal affirmative procedure, but we consider there is justification for having the option of made affirmative procedure when urgent action is necessary. It is also worth emphasising that the prisoner release power is an extended temporary power rather than making the COVID-specific provision a, temp a permanent power. Uh, the committee uh, also now has my full response to its report on the use of the made affirmative procedure. I explained in the covering letter to that response that I was responding in general terms to the committee's recommendations, and I hope the committee has found that to be a helpful explanation of the government's position. Um, I have also said that I'd be happy to consider specific recommendations from the committee in more detail in the context of its scrutiny of the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Bill, and I stand ready to do so. The committee will now be familiar with my views on the intricacies of subordinate legislation procedures. Uh, so, rather than repeating those, I will happily answer questions from the committee. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, so, certainly when the committee considers proposed delegated powers in any bill, its first question is always to consider whether or not it is appropriate to delegate the powers in the first place. And there are five powers in the bill which would allow the made affirmative procedure to be used, as you have quite rightly indicated. Can you explain why you considered it was appropriate to delegate these powers? The, in relation to the delegation of powers um, involved in the bill, um, the rationale is to recognise the necessity of us taking sufficiently comprehensive action should we face the challenges of an intensification of the coronavirus uh, pandemic or uh, another comparable um, incident of, of, of a similar st uh, style and scale. Um, the, uh, there are existing provisions in legislation in the Public Health Scotland Act 2008 which gives some limited localised powers to deal with um, what I would describe as uh, localised outbreaks of concern. But when it comes to dealing with a situation of the magnitude that we have been dealing with around about uh, COVID, uh, the statute book is, uh, is ill-equipped for such, um, such measures. So, what we are trying to do is to complete the statute book to ensure that it has the adequate powers available and that there is a scheme of delegation in place that is appropriate to deal with both the necessity of parliamentary scrutiny but also the necessity of urgent action should that be required given the circumstances that we face. Thank you. Um, certainly, of the five instruments, of the five delegated powers, sorry, um, the, the fifth one, that's paragraph 24 one of the schedule, which is the power to release early from prison or young offenders institution. That one is only related to COVID, as you indicated, whereas the other uh, four uh, are to be extended. Can you explain the reasoning behind that, please? The, the reasoning behind which 
behind the why you limited uh, the delegated powers uh, on the release of prisoners to be only for COVID? Be beca because of the, the, the necessity of the situation in relation to COVID might require us to take particular steps, as we had to do uh, during the COVID pandemic. But as a general rule of thumb, it was not envisaged as being a power that was appropriate um, uh, to be contained within legislation of this type on a long-term basis. Okay, thank you. Um, and certainly whilst recognising that any primary legislation uh, would likely have to be expedited, uh, it could provide greater options for parliamentary scrutiny whilst also taking into account the specific nature of the current situation. Can you set out how you decided to include delegated powers in the bill rather than introduce primary legislation at the point of necessity? I think it, it relates essentially to the, the issue of predictability, convener. We, we can be pretty certain that we will face further challenges um, in the form of a pandemic in the years to come. What we can't be certain about is the exact presentation of the challenges that will come from that. So essentially what we are trying to do is to create an approach here which equips the statute book with the necessary powers to enable us to act in, um, in all circumstances where we face a, a national public health emergency. Um, but also provides for sufficient scope for us to tailor the interventions and the specifics of legislation that we put in place to reflect those circumstances, which of itself would be the subject to parliamentary scrutiny, either through the affirmative process or in a sense of necessity and urgency, the made affirmative process. So essentially what it is trying to do is to, in principle, establish the statute book with the necessary powers and responsibilities to, um, to, 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 to be exercised after full and proper parliamentary consideration, but then also leave the scope for us to adapt and to adjust to the challenge as it presents itself, but still enabling parliamentary scrutiny of those measures uh, as to whether they are appropriate uh, or not in given circumstances. And of course, um, even with the made affirmative procedure, um, there is the scope for, um, for parliamentary scrutiny, albeit once the, uh, the, the, the measures have come into force. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to hand over to Graham Simpson. Graham. Thanks very much, convener. Um, hello again. Mr. Swinney, Good morning. morning. Um, can I start by just asking you something about the, the letter that the committee received uh, yesterday from yourself? Um, now, having gone through it, um, it, it seems to me the general tone of that letter seems to be that you, your view appears to be that the Scottish Government is not doing much wrong. Uh, in terms of uh, made affirmative. Um, uh, and when you consider the, our, our report and the debate that we had in the chamber, I, I was disappointed. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, I was disappointed when I read that letter. Um, you don't seem to be accepting much of what the committee uh, has been saying. Um, you know, so if you think I've got that wrong, please, please say so. Um, well, uh, Bluntly, I do think Mr. Simpson's got it wrong. Um, I think the, um, what my response to the committee, either in the giving of evidence or in contributions to debates or in the correspondence I've exchanged with the committee, has broadly gone along the lines that um, the nature of the pandemic is such that it has required us to act at pace, which is why we've had to use the made affirmative procedure on the number of occasions that we have used it on. Um, and that's been 
of necessity. Now, Mr Sweeney has raised, raised when I was here last week, the possibility of whether there's a, you know, a, 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 a hybrid option between um, made affirmative and affirmative, and I, I'm happy to engage in that. I confirm that in the submission that I've given to the committee yesterday, that I'm quite happy to confirm that. But, you know, if, 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 if in a public health emergency, ministers are faced with the choice of, you know, very difficult scenario today and wait 40 days for parliamentary scrutiny, I'm afraid to say I I'm going to consider act now because people might die if I don't. So um, the response is set within the context of that. Now, I accept in the, in the statement, in, in the response, a number of other points. Um, I indicate that there are, I think the government operates to high standards of drafting. Uh, if there are issues with that drafting, uh, which, which we don't get right, we accept that, we confront it, we address it. If there are others that you, the committee doesn't believe that we've done that, then I'm very, I've said in my submission, I'll happily consider those. Um, I also go on in the um, response to talk about a specific issue where the committee asks for consolidation of, of of instruments, which in principle I'm sympathetic to, but there are a lot of practical issues come into the resources that are required to consolidate all of these instruments um, whilst we are dealing with a public health emergency. But in principle, I'm welcoming of such an approach. So um, that's the, um, you know, the substance of the response from the government is designed to be helpful, um, but I suspect if, if Mr Simpson was looking for me in that submission to a, abandon the necessity of the made affirmative procedure, then I, I'm afraid I can't do that because I would be endangering the lives of members of the public if I did so. I, w I, would, I wouldn't uh, expect you to do that. I'm not expecting you to do that. Um, what I am trying to achieve is, uh, is get to a point as how we move on from from our report and your response. Um, uh, I mean, you give a response uh, to the, the, the committee saying that we we think that whenever you use a made affirmative procedure, uh, there should be a statement as to why you believe it's urgent. Uh, and you say in your response, uh, my view, that's your view, is that the Scottish Government already provides a clear explanation of the rationale for urgency but you do go on to say that you're happy to work with the committee to consider how that could be better codified in practice. So I was really keen to get to a point of how we can work together to get to a point where you provide something, in my view, better than you're doing at the moment, uh, a proper explanation of why something uh, is urgent. I think the... Uh, well, uh, you know, I, 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 I think that what we've set out in, in that particular response is entirely appropriate. I think, you know, the government does make a statement about, I think it's a point of fact, the government does make a statement about why we consider um, the made affirmative procedure is required because something is of an urgent nature. We set out the rationale for that. But I go on to say... I'm happy to work with the committee to consider how that could be better codified in practice for current and future made affirmative powers. That's an indication of my willingness if there's... I think we're doing that. If the committee wishes to say to me, well, if you did it this way, if you covered that detail, if you covered this point, then I'll happily consider that. But, you know, uh, the committee is, is, is... If the committee makes suggestions of that type, I will happily consider them as to how we do that. That's, that, that's maybe something we can look at. Can I ask a general question um, about the, the bill then? Because it, it covers a, a wide range of areas, um, ranging from education to tenancy rights uh, to justice and, uh, and, and health, and indeed health matters. Why, why did you take, um, you know, why, why did you put all this in one bill? And not split it up because some of these power, some of the things in this bill are quite far-reaching, 
Um, for, for example, when you look at tenancy rights, um, you could argue that actually what's in the bill has got nothing to do with public health, but has everything to do with tenancy rights and and changing um, changing the way we do um, you know rent, rent rental rental law in, in this country. So why not just introduce a separate bill? Um, when there is, there is work going on already in this area, consultations out there, why not do it that way? There are obviously choices that are available to ministers in the formulation of legislation. And um, one of the issues that I considered, along with my ministerial colleagues, was whether um, we should do exactly what Mr Simpson has talked about, which is to put um, these measures in their compartments in different pieces of legislation, or whether we should essentially take the route of consolidation, which is to consolidate the legislative change that was required um, as a consequence of the pandemic. Because the purpose of this legislation is essentially to equip the statute book across a whole range of different legislative questions with um, the capacity to handle a pandemic should that come our way again. Now, there is an arguable case on either point uh, to either compartmentalise this and do it in a number of different pieces of legislation or to take the consolidation route. And I opted to take the consolidation route because I felt there was a rational basis in the aftermath of the pandemic for us to update the statute book to learn the lessons from our experience and to put in place the changes that were required. Now, there is a different character to some of the proposals in the bill. So the justice provisions, for example, in part five, are titled temporary justice measures. You know, they are there quite simply because if we don't undertake those changes, then the implications for the exercise of judicial responsibilities um, will be um, will be significant, but they're not permanent changes. They're there to put in place a framework which is envisaged will operate until 2025. Some of the others are about powers that um, we may use if we face a pandemic, but we won't use them if we don't. And others are some um, relatively straightforward. Indeed, I think Mr Simpson said to me last week when I was here that some of the changes that we were making in relation to digital access were you know, perfectly straightforward, reasonable propositions. So the argument is quite simply between um, consolidation in the aftermath of, of a pandemic or multiple pieces of legislation that stand alone. And of course, quite a number of these would um, face significant delay in getting round to doing them because of the other legislative burdens that Parliament wrestles with. And I suppose lastly, um, the, the, the relevant point is that, of course, this is primary legislation. So Parliament can scrutinise every single letter in this legislation. Um, it, it can in, it can indeed, but it just covers such a wide area, and and you know we've already well the education committee um, has already taken evidence um, saying that there, there is a view that uh, some of the education provisions may well be unlawful. So you run the risk of if this all goes through um, of facing legal challenge. Let's say in relation to let's say it was just a narrow legal challenge relating to the education part, and the whole thing could fall. So, uh, I mean, it might be, from your point, uh, I mean, from my point of view, I don't like the bill full stop. From your point of view, you want to get it through, but, you know, the whole thing could fall because you've decided to lump it together and, and there's a legal challenge. There's always a, there's always a risk of legal challenge. Um, the, the incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law is a standalone bespoke provision that looks to incorporate the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into our domestic legislation. One provision of that has been challenged by the United Kingdom government. 
because uh, the UK government doesn't want the, um, the, the application of the provisions of the UNCRC to be applied in areas where it has historically legislated. Now, that's one part of, the, of, of a compartmentalised bill. So Mr Simpson totally undermines his whole argument by the practice of his colleague who's the Secretary of State for Scotland, who's done exactly what Mr Simpson is talking about on one compartmentalised theme bill. So there's just no substance to the view that Mr Simpson is putting to me. Well, you're in front of me and he isn't, so I'm asking you about your bill. Um, can I, uh, I'm just going to put something to you because you, you, you gave an answer to the convener. I've just got two more questions, short questions, um, where the convener um, asked you about the power to release early from prison and, and he said, rightly, that just related to COVID. The rest of the bill um, is rather wider. Um, you say in your the delegated powers memorandum and I'm not really making a comment on this I'm just going to read it out because it, I, I found it curious um, in your justification uh, for using delegated powers you say in addition to COVID there have been relatively recent outbreaks of new diseases SARS and MERS and instances of contamination such as Salisbury now, you know, obviously Salisbury was uh, limited to Salisbury, so I just wonder why you, why that's in there. Um, it's simply in there to indicate that there are threats and challenges of a public health nature, which can have potentially widespread effect. That's why it's in there as an example. The the others are examples of. Um, significant outbreaks of new diseases which to a greater or lesser extent have um, had an effect within our um, society but have had much greater effect in other societies but it doesn't mean to say it won't have an effect here of a similar of a similar and comparable nature and so therefore having the capacity and the ability to respond to circumstances that we face is an important point of this legislation. Okay. Final question, Kavina. I'll just go back to what I was asking you about last week, uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, and that is the regulations to close school boarding accommodation and student accommodation. Um, we spoke last week uh, about your desire to have uh, an extra six months of that power, even though you never used it, uh, and now you want it permanently so how do, how do you justify having that power permanently when it's never been used it's never been needed no i think the i think the point comes back here that, that there are various and this comes back to point of principle about the purpose of the statute book the, the statute book is there for a, a variety of different reasons um, it is there to codify and to define uh, the, the, the rule of law uh, in relation to certain provisions. It is there to provide for a clarity on the law in scenarios that happen, have happened, might happen. Um, and the statute book is there to provide crystal clear information to individuals and organisations about their obligations. So there's just three points about what is the purpose, purpose of the statute book. And there are provisions in statute which relate to events and circumstances that have never happened. But they are there to provide us with the capacity of dealing with them should they happen. So if, if I take the logic of Mr Simpson's argument. Um, we could, on the basis of Mr Simpson's argument, we should have no civil contingencies legislation because we've not had to face a civil contingency issue. Now, I would argue that the pandemic was pretty close to a civil contingency. 
So therefore, there's the justification for having powers in the statute book, which we might never use, but if we face a situation and we don't have the powers in place, that gets us into really tricky territory. And that, that is the fundamental issue this bill is about. It's the fundamental issue I disagree with Mr Simpson about, is whether or not the statute book should be prepared for different eventualities that may come our way. Sorry, convener, but I was asking about a specific part of the bill, and I don't think the Deputy First Minister has addressed that point. I've, uh, that's, so that's, that, that's, that's my justification is, that I think the, 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 the statute book, we, we may have a, we may, there may be a need for us to take action to close or restrict access to boarding school accommodation. We may have there's never been that need. You've relied on guidance. You've never needed to do it. Well, what if we... What Why if can't we, you just rely on what guidance? If we, what if we encounter an unwilling partner? Like who? Pardon? Like who? Well, who would be unwilling? You've so relied on guidance. Well, well I, I'm simply wanting there to be clarity in the statute book so that we know that we have the ability to act should we face those circumstances. Move on. Thank you. Um, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think we're keen to sort of make sure the bill is as shovel-ready as possible, given any eventuality. And I think um, one matter that the committee really wanted to, to make clear was that it should be a statutory requirement for Scottish Minister to provide a written statement prior to um, any instrument coming into force. Um, the five powers as drafted in the, the face of the bill, however, do not provide for that statement clearly. Um, so is that an area where um, you as Minister might consider putting that on the face of the bill? So there is a clear and controvertible explicit requirement to provide that written statement. I think that's an adjustment we would really appreciate. I, I, th I think that's a, a, an adjustment that we can a, consider and would be likely to, to move to. Um, I've taken an approach in relation to the recent self-isolation bill where uh, we took on an explicit responsibility to set out the rationale for an, uh, the necessity of acting with urgency. So um, I, I'm very happy to consider that, but it, it, it doesn't strike me as... Um, uh, well, it, stri it strikes me as a change the government would be likely to embrace. Uh, given what we've done in the self-isolation bill. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's positive. Uh, so thanks very much for that. Um, noted the, the letter that was sent to the committee yesterday from, from you, and um, certainly in respect of the expedited affirmative procedure that we discussed, um, welcome the, the, the indication from the government that um, they would um, explore the idea of developing that protocol. Um, my sort of thinking is, can we tie it to this bill and the development of this bill in a way that would actually help to inject some pace into the development of it? I know it's a fine and hypothetical sense to sort of say, well, let's develop it in due course. Perhaps it's a, it's a worthwhile exercise in the course of developing this bill to actually try and establish that protocol in the development of this legislation so it, it's tested. And there's certainly examples, for example, where in the course of the last couple of years there's made affirmative uh, procedures that have been used that we could then say, well, what would, have, what would we have done had we used this expedited procedure? How would we model it? Uh, and then we could perhaps try and, be between the committee and the government, try and establish what that could look like. Um, and of course, with the Parliamentary Bureau, if necessary, um, to try and say, well, in such a future scenario, this would be a, a more balanced approach um, and would reach a kind of equilibrium. And then maybe we could try and, try and codify it to some extent in the, in the development of the bill. Seems like it might be a a potential way just to try and nail that and anchor it in some way that's firmer. Uh. The, the first thing I would say is that um, I'm, I'm wholly committed to exploring that, if I may call it the third way, if that's not too offensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to, um, to, to explore that. I think the, the challenge is that the the details of that, and I'll, I'll maybe take some advice from uh, Stephen McGregor perhaps in a moment, um, having said what I'm about to say, but I, I, I think we'd need input in, from the standards 
committee perspective on standing orders. So it, it, it then becomes, you know, slightly broader undertaking. I've, I'm not familiar with where the standards committee workload is, just in terms of addressing that within the same time scale for the scrutiny of the bill. But what I would want to say is that um, I wouldn't want um, anything in, you know, if, if the government, if we proceed with the timetable for the legis this legislation, that in no way dampens the government's willingness to participate in the discussion about, well, how do we get an alternative a proposition put in place that is somewhere between made affirmative and um, an expedited procedure? And uh, I'm very happy to, to, to look at how we might uh, apply that. I don't know if you want to add anything to, to that. Um, just that if there's different ways of doing it, obviously you can do it by a protocol which gives us more flexibility. We've done that in relation to EU legislation and we wouldn't need to amend the bill to achieve that. If you're looking at creating a, you know, a whole new procedure in legislation, I think that, that is much more complicated and might take a bit more time and probably would involve the Standards Committee and other interests. Um, well, I think we've established in principle options. Um, it might be worth perhaps taking that away as an action to, to look at liaising with the, the standards committee perhaps and we can maybe maintain correspondence about what might be an appropriate measure um i think effectively we're I've probably agreed on the desirability of the outcome it's a question of what's the most practical mechanism to deliver it whether it's a protocol um or whether it's something more formalized on the face of the bill i guess the committee would need to reflect and take a view on that itself but um it might be worth continuing this discussion in that respect then and, and, and some of that discussion could be influenced by the first question that Mr Sweeney put to me, which was about what is the nature of any undertaking and explanation the government gives about the use of the made affirmative procedure, for example, which um, can meet a certain, can have certain characteristics about it that give demonstrable reason why the made affirmative procedure should be used in a particular circumstance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I was just uh, trying to clarify the time scale of the bill in terms of stage two and stage three. Um, do you have that information to hand out? Uh, I, I, I don't have that information to hand uh, at this stage. Obviously, the government is working with the um, parliamentary timetables on um, the passage of the legislation, but I suspect will be, depending on the nature of the process that we were going through, we may find ourselves in a in a different time scale. Okay, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Um, thanks, Peter. I think it's just important to establish that the desire is to really develop this this capability within the Parliament. Because I think it's a, a gap that's rightfully been identified, uh, and I think the government agrees with that. Um, that you know, necessity is the mother of invention, sort of thing. So let's try and use this as a lessons learned exercise. And I think there is a bit less urgency in trying to drive this bill. In that sense, we can take time to get it right. Um, and perhaps, if there is a degree of flexibility, it seems like it's not a firm timetable already established. So we can perhaps work collaboratively with the different interest groups in the parliament and the government to try and come to an agreement on that. Um, so I think if that can be agreed in principle today, that's a good thing. Um, the government will certainly happily cooperate with uh, with all of those processes, uh, as I've indicated. We will do so. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Sweeney? Yeah, well, After that, thanks. Okay, thank you, um, Craig Coy. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sweeney. Um, I suppose just a, two or three general questions before I go into some questions of specific detail in, in relation to some of the uh, dele uh, delegated um, measures. One is obviously just looking at this bill. Obviously, this bill will be in place beyond this present government, even beyond this on the statute book. And whilst I wouldn't want to question the the, the the character or the motivations of this government, we are obviously giving future governments quite considerable powers here. And a lot of it rests on the definition of a public health emergency or a public health threat. So, do you want to just give the, the committee? Obviously, we've seen COVID, but could you just give us perhaps some other examples of? where a public health emergency or, or threat might, might arise? Well, we do, we do that in the, uh, the Delegated Powers Memorandum, as I uh, was rehearsing there with Mr Simpson. But um, fundamentally, the judgment on these questions is informed by 
advice that the government would receive from its chief medical officer, who obviously has a, a you know a role um, in statute to provide such advice to government and, and already in a, a whole variety of other different statutes, the, the chief medical officer's view is what drives a number of provisions, nothing to do with this bill, which are in the existing statute. Um, and obviously the chief medical officer um, is making a view based on his or her professional assessment of the situation that we face. And uh, you know, I would argue that's exactly as it should be, so that we are influenced by um, high quality, independent clinical and epidemiological advice uh, about the situation that we face. The other point I'd make is that um, in, uh, in trying to answer Mr Hoy's question and understand exactly why it's asked, it, it, it almost um, invites me to define the undefinable because we don't know quite what might be coming our way. Uh, if we didn't feel that um, over the last two years, we certainly have felt it over the last two weeks um, in relation to the awful situation in Ukraine. So. I think the, the 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 nature of how our statute book is constructed on many of these issues around public health, which hinges often on the advice of chief medical officer, is designed to essentially give us that ability to interrogate and to interpret events as they are unfolding to then come to a view as to what merits the necessary action by by ministers. And I suppose the challenge of any part of legislation is to make sure that that, um, that advice can be offered, it can be considered by ministers, and Parliament can exercise accountability over that judgment. But you would accept that it's sort of difficult to legislate in a sort of Donald Rumsfeld approach to known knowns and known unknowns. There's got to be some specificity to it. So is there more that you could do on the face of the bill to uh, flesh out what you mean by a public health emergency or a public health threat? Otherwise, it, it could be open to interpretation or misinterpretation by future administrations. Well, ultimately, what Parliament has got to satisfy itself about is uh, does it have the right... Um, legislative arrangements in place to deal with any given scenario. Now, you know, I, I, I think the statute book has a number of very strong um, characteristics about it, not least of which is the ability of the chief medical officer, for example, uh, to offer his view as to what is the nature of a situation we face. Um, and, and that's an influence the judgment that has gone into the construction of this legislation. Obviously, um, it is um, a matter um, for Parliament to scrutinise as to whether or not it, uh, it believes that uh, appropriate uh, descriptions and explanations are in place within the legislation, and the government will obviously consider that further. Obviously, Parliament will, will do that, but the courts might also uh, scrutinise um, the legislation or uh, the implementation or enactment of, of that legislation at some point in the future. What seems to, to, to distinguish this, this bill and... Um, the measures it would affect is that we're passing it into law on a permanent basis. And the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 15, which could have we could have challenged many of the measures that have been brought in during the pandemic, gave you the, the, the safeguard and the certainty that, that, that they couldn't be challenged because uh, it says um, that governments can act in exceptional circumstances in a limited and supervised manner, free from obligations to secure certain rights and freedoms under the Convention. But one of those elements there is that obviously it's limited and, and supervised, whereas passing this into legislation on a permanent basis means that you're losing that time-limited nature. So are you certain that this, this bill, um, or that Article 15, would, would give you some safeguards if this bill was passed into law? I think it does, because the, the, the powers um, that are envisaged in the bill are powers that can only be used should certain scenarios arise that are in themselves compatible with Article 15. So the, you know, these are not routine, everyday powers. And the statute book has got um, other powers in place that can only be used in certain given circumstances, which you know, potentially could have the same 
coming to the same scope that Mr Hoy puts to me uh, in his question. Um, but uh, without that, you know, we, we, we would end up with a statute book that really was ill-prepared for um, certain emergency circumstances. And I, given what we've gone through in the last two years, given the, the way that we've had to address these issues in extremis, I don't think that's a desirable outcome. Okay. And indeed, and indeed, I think Parliament itself, you know, if I think back to the passage of the legislation, you know, there's a lot of parliamentary goodwill to get the legislation passed and the, uh, the, 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 the fundamental legislation in the previous session. But um, although there was a lot of goodwill, there was quite a lot of complaints about the fact that we weren't doing this in slow time. Um, so I think it would be better to do this in slow time, do it carefully, uh, put it into statute, but make sure it can only be used in the a situation of extremis. OK, just a couple of um, specific questions really in, in, in relation to um, the measures. You refer, referred, obviously, to the fact that the government takes advice from the chief medical officer in terms of protecting the, the public health. And, and, and then those regulations will flow from that. In relation, in particular, to education and educational establishments, there doesn't appear to be in the bill any requirement for the powers that are about to be exercised um, through the made affirmative procedure for any impact assessment to take place uh, of the impact of the instrument that will be made under those powers. So do you agree it is important that those affected um, understand the impact of the regulations? and that this information is accessible and, and clear and published in a timely manner. And would you consider amending the bill so that such a requirement for that process is, is included? I'll take that point away and reflect on it, because my first reaction is to say that the, the, all of the requirements and points that Mr Hoy puts to me, I would have judged would be covered by our obligation in terms of the variety of impact assessments that we are required by other statute to do in any given circumstance. So, um, where it's appropriate to, to undertake a business regulated impact assessment, um, where it's necessary to undertake an equalities impact assessment, um, and there will be other uh, statutory requirements, I would have thought they would have all been, the, 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 the point that's been put to me, would have been caught by all of those existing obligations. But I will take that point away to satisfy myself that there isn't a gap there, which, because the, the, the sentiment is one that I accept unreservedly. Just in relation to the measures for, in relation to uh, release from prison and young offenders institutions, obviously these are exceptional in relation to this bill because they are specifically COVID-related and time-limited. Just to take you back to uh, perhaps your opening remarks, if you want a statute, uh, you want a statute that's fit for purpose, why wouldn't you want to have the capacity to uh, release prisoners early um, in another pandemic situation or beyond 2025? Simply because those are, they are not a sort of, ordinary elements of policy that we would want to have in place. Nor is um, shutting an educational boarding uh, facility. But it may be a necessity of its, of, it, of its time, and we don't particularly want to be releasing prisoners out of the necessity of the time. No, but I think it's the logic dictates one or the other. Surely you want a statute book that gives you the capacity to do it in certain defined circumstances, or you don't. That's that. That's why I think Mr Simpson and I are, are challenging the whole nature of the bill, because you're effectively passing into law certain powers that you would like to keep into the future and telling us that you require them, and other legislation that you're saying you're happy to let fall in 2025, or by your own logic, surely you would want to keep the capacity to do that in place. Well, no, because the, essentially the... There, there's a question of necessity kicks in on these questions and the necessity to, um, for example, move to a situation where our schools were not um, functioning in the normal fashion to which we um, were accustomed is a, um, is a, you know, was a particular necessity we had to, to face. We 
would want to be in a situation to avoid the necessity of releasing prisoners because courts have decided that prisoners must serve particular sentences and there is no uh, particular rationale and reason why that should um, be there in perpetuity because it conflicts with fundamental um, elements of our legislative framework and the expectations of members of the public about the nature of how we um, how we uh, handle those circumstances. Are you saying you think it's it's politically unpalatable to extend it beyond that? I'm simply saying that it's um, it's a provision that um, would not be one that ordinarily the government would want to, in an emergency, have the necessity to undertake. But if your first priority is to safeguard the public, including uh, those who are in prison, surely you'd want to keep that power in the statute book to utilise at some point in the future. But, but essentially we are codifying where we can do that and where we believe we have the, the basis of so acting to enable us to exercise those powers. Okay, I'm not sure I necessarily follow the, the logic of that position, but just finally in relation to the measures in relation to the private uh, sector attendances, um, obviously, I think Mr Simpson referred to it, the new deal for tenants draft is uh, out for consultation until the 15th of April 2022. Uh, so I'm slightly at a loss to work out why legislation that effectively preempts that consultation is being in included in this bill and wouldn't be far better to be removed from this bill and to be included in any future uh, housing uh, legislation so that you can be cognizant of the, the consultation responses. I, I think that comes back then to the, the question in principle about whether or not we're taking a consolidated route to the handling of the issues that have arisen around about um, you know, pandemic handling, if I can call it that, um, or whether or not we are taking all those issues out element by element and putting them into the wider policy development work that we undertake um, on wider questions around housing and tenancies. And you know, the choice that ministers have made, that I ministers have made, have been to put um, a bill together that essentially tries to um, update the statute book in the light of the pandemic experience rather than to take the, um, the compartmentalised approach. Just finally, if I may, just on this particular measure, though, in Section 37, aren't you really just putting the cart before the horse here? Wouldn't it be better just to pause, wait for the consultation and then come back with further primary legislation uh, as, as and when it's required? I don't think we're doing that because we are, for, for all the reasons that I've just given, that you know, we've reflected on the experience of the pandemic, we've taken um, account of those experiences and formulated a legislative proposition which gives us the powers to act in certain circumstances. Obviously, if there is further legislative change, and you know, I would imagine in the years to come there will be further tenancy changes, I imagine that will be the case. Um, so uh, there is obviously the opportunity to reflect on any provisions um, at, at the time that that legislation has been considered by Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, you've covered a very great range of things that I was thinking I might be asking anyway, but um, uh, just to... Uh, to look at a um, principle that a committee has that there should be a statutory requirement that any instrument uh, made using the affirmative procedure must contain a sunset provision. Um, can you outline your approach when setting such review requirements? Um, how the Scottish Government decides on what the sunset should be, basically, you know, how far it may go? I think it's it, there's obviously an argument for sunset provisions. Um, I think the difficulty is that we, we we cannot predict the moment at which we might face uh, a, a pandemic, for example, and how long it will go on for, and whether it will coincide with the intricacies of um, parliamentary sitting arrangements. To to to, to be blunt about it. So we could find ourselves in a situation where we have a gap in the statute book because um, 
Parliament is not sitting, but there would be a necessity for us to undertake particular provisions. So it's about taking an orderly approach to ensuring the statute book is um, is in a fit state to be able to uh, respond to uh, different challenges. Thank you. Um, just on that, then, um, when you are uh, when you are bringing forward legislation for consideration by Parliament, um, is a sunset provision, if we are allowed to call it that, um, is that considered at that time, rather than waiting until we see how things are going to develop? It, it, it would have to be considered at that time. Um, and obviously there are certain arrangements within the, um, within the bill where, for example, um, in the made affirmative procedure, if, um, if, if, if that is applied, but Parliament does not support or endorse the, uh, the provision, then it lapses uh, after a given period of time. So there are, you know, th th these provisions are built into the legislation at its um, at its uh, design. But uh, obviously, th there is the provision for ministers to consider um, any other provisions that may come forward of that nature, which um, may, members may wish to add to the bill during the course of its passage. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kidd. Um, Mr. Simpson. Thanks again, Convener. Um, I just want to come back on this point about freeing prisoners early because I'm, I genuinely I am struggling to understand the logic of your position, Mr. Swinney. So you are saying that obviously we don't want to be in a position where we're freeing people early. Um, however, your position appears to be that. If it's COVID related, then that is something that we should consider. If it's not COVID related, we should not consider it. And when I, you know, I read out to you um, earlier your delegated powers memorandum, I'll redo another bit. Delegated powers are appropriate to deal with future public health threats that could pose a significant ri risk to public health as they are, by their nature, unpredictable and sometimes unforeseeable. Your, your whole rationale for this entire bill is that we need these powers because, because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. It could be anything. Uh, it, could be, it could be the stuff that you've listed uh, in this document. It could be something else. And yet, when it comes to releasing prisoners early, you want to... Uh, restrict that power to just COVID. There appears to be no logic to that. I think the, I think the logic is quite simply that we don't want in any circumstances to be um, taking a policy approach which envisages releasing prisoners early. But we've got, but we've, you know, we've had to do it once in May 2020. Um, we don't. We, we've still got the COVID threat hanging over us just now. We don't think that is a provision that we should have available to us on an ongoing basis for um, for that policy element. But in other respects in the bill, there are a range of options we have to have at our disposal to help us to deal with the public health emergency. That's the simple distinction I would make. That's, that's not, it's just illogical. It's an illogical position. It would be more logical to remove this entirely from the bill. But Mr Simpson is free to advance an amendment to that. Well, to, well, to I may, that may well do that to help you out. Um, I'll leave it there. So now, do colleagues have any final questions before we move on? No. OK. OK, uh, with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank the Deputy First Minister um, and his colleagues uh, for coming in front of the committee today. Uh, and with that, I will su suspend the meeting briefly uh, to allow the Cabinet Secretary and officials to leave the table. Thank you.
Moving to agenda item number three, we're considering an instrument subject to the affirmative procedure. It is the draft prohibition of smoking outside hospital buildings, Scotland Regulations 2022. Is the committee content with this instrument? Thank you. Under a, a question: Did this appear um, a couple of weeks ago, or was it something similar in the committee papers? No, we can't, can't recall. Oh, okay. this, this is the first time. Yep. Okay, so is the committee content with the instrument? Yeah. Under agenda item number four, we're considering instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 66, 68, 70, 71, 72, and 73. Is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you. Under agenda item number five, we're considering instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 67 and 78. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I'll move the committee into private.